Hey, welcome to our live streaming broadcast. Thank you so much for joining. We're going to get right into the inside look at the real estate examination. I have some questions I want to share with you, and they are absolutely great questions. And you, yes, you could very well see these on the real estate examination. So let's don't waste any time whatsoever. Let's get right into some of the questions that I have prepared for you. And we will also go back and take a look at some of these new questions that I've heard about as well. Well, the first question I want to ask you is which statement best describes a multiple listing service? Now, remember the multiple listing service or the MLS is used by real estate companies that are normally affiliated with the Association of Realtors. So it's an organization. Doesn't always have to be that way, but in most instances, the local association will create what is called a an MLS, a multiple listing service. I've been using the MLS for many, many years. But when you read this question here, it's asking, is this an agent's listing portal? Is it an advertising portal for listings? Is it a referral portal for real estate agents? Or is it an organization real estate agents use for sharing commissions and exchanging data about properties? Well, this is a great question because some of the pieces to each one of those answers are just a little bit correct. However, and, you, and, and the reason I want to point that out is because on exam day, you will see some questions where you will say, well, A, A is correct if or but or well, if, well, anytime you start doing that, you're going to get yourself in trouble, okay? But when you just look at all four choices and you say, well, which one is the best answer, John? The best answer is D because it is an organization real estate agents use for sharing commissions and exchanging data about properties. Yes, we... Um, we can use it as a portal for listings because some MLSs actually have a portal that go, when we say a portal, it goes out on the internet. You could also aggregate your listings through that portal for your website. And, you know, it to some degree, we could use it. I mean, stretching it, but to some degree, C could be correct as well. But the correct answer is D, as in Delta. And you just need to understand this. Commissions are really what um, helps you understand what your commission is going to be from the other agency. Now, I've told, told you this many, many times, and I want you to remember this because this is an exam question as well. Commissions are always what? They're always negotiable. And they're negotiable between the broker and the client or the principal. Commissions are negotiable between brokers and commissions are negotiable between the broker and the agents in their own company. So let's take for example that I'm going to be showing your listing. I go show your listing. I print the MLS sheet off. I'm giving you a real life example of how this works and has worked throughout my career. And I've seen agents in my own office who work for me fail to find out what their compensation is before going out and showing the property. So you see a house listed or a client calls you up. You're a you're an agent for a buyer, your, your buyer calls you up and, and says, hey, John, I want to look at this house over on um, such and such street. And you call the other agency up and you say, or you use showing time, which we have now, and you set the appointment up, you go over, you show the property, you print out the brochure for the, your, your client, you give it to the client. Uh, they love it. You write a contract 
the contract gets accepted, you show up at the closing table or you get the closing uh, disclosure documents from the title company, the escrow agency, the day before closing, You're supposed to get them 24 hours before. And you look on there and you say, wait a minute, uh, that, I've, I've figured out my commission and I'm supposed to get this much money. And lo and behold, the other agent was only offering a certain percentage, which was lower than what you had anticipated. Well, first of all, commissions are what? They're always negotiable. That you can't price fix. You can't say, well, everybody charges this fee or everybody charges that fee. Commissions are always negotiable. So when you go back and you look at this question, it is an organization real estate agents use for sharing commissions and exchanging data about properties. That's where I can tell you as another member, I'd love for you to help sell my property over on Autumn Chase Lane. And oh, by the way, down here where it says how much commission I'm going to share for any buyer's agent or co-op agent or transactional broker or sub agent, it's this fee right here because commissions are always negotiable. And so uh, I go through that long scenario for you to just remind you as a real estate agent that you always need to check and find out what your commission is prior to showing the property. Now, remember, if you're a buyer's agent, I'm trying to cover a lot of information that's on the exam here. If you're a buyer's agent, you have a fiduciary obligation to your client. Remember when you entered into a buyer's agency agreement that created this thing called cold, C-O-A-L-D, care, obedience, accounting, loyalty, and disclosure. So if that's the property your client wants to look at, you need to show it to them. And if you're only going to earn a dollar, you need to show it to them because you have a fiduciary obligation to your client. Now, when you entered into your buyer's agency agreement, you should have said to your client or consumer at that time, here's our buyer's agency agreement. Now, I want you to understand that you know, this is the fee our company charges buyers for us to represent them. Now, I'll try to collect my fee through the seller, but the seller may not want to pay me a fee or may only want to pay me a dollar. And if that's the case, you will have to pay me the difference between whatever the seller's willing to pay me and what my company charges because commissions are always negotiable. Okay. That's a long drawn out conversation we can get into later. You want to know how to pass this test and I want to help you. So uh, just remember what statement best describes a multiple listing service. Well, it's an organization real estate agents use for sharing commissions and exchanging data about properties. I did cover a lot of information you may very well see on the exam. So don't panic because you will see something about commissions being negotiable between brokers and brokers, brokers and agents and brokers and clients. And you also need to remember that what the listing or the buyer's agency agreement, agency agreements are between the broker and the client, not you, the salesperson. Okay, you're going to see those two on the exam for sure. Trust me. Tom Riley entered into an oral lease for two years with Bob Smith. The lease is not enforceable due to, well, would that be the uni Uniform Commercial Code? Would it be the statute of frauds, the statute of limitation, or the state usury laws? Well, the correct answer is a statute of frauds. Remember, contracts exceeding one year to perform must be in writing. If such contracts are not in writing, they are unenforceable. Statute of limitations is the time period something expires. If you uh, committed a criminal act or did something wrong and it was 20 years had gone by, the statute of limitations may have run out. Statute of frauds 
that's the piece that says contracts need to be in writing and a lease that is for longer than one year needs to be in writing. You will see a question about the statute of frauds. And I want you to remember that says contracts need to be in writing, but leases that are over one year, they need to be in writing. That's the reason for that. Well, Susie is a listing a home for Matt and Sharon. Matt asks Susie when the effective delivery of a deed takes place. Susie tells Matt and Sharon that it depends upon blank. Which statement is correct? So Susie's basically telling Matt and Sharon that it depends upon when the physical transfer of a deed to the grantee takes place when the grantor's signature has been notarized, when the intention of the grantor is completed, or when the grantor records the deed at the county courthouse. So Susie's listing a home for Matt and Sharon. Matt asks Susie when the effective delivery of a deed takes place. Susie tells Matt and Sharon that it depends upon A, B, C, or D. Well, the correct answer is C, when the intention of the grantor is completed. Intention of the grantor is the effective delivery. Now, see that? That's the effective delivery. The deed is presumed to be delivered when the when it's given to the grantee, recorded, or placed in escrow. But it's kind of a trick question here because they're asking about the intention. And so the intention would be when the intention of the grantor is completed. That's the effective delivery. But the actual delivery, as you can see, and I'll go back over here to this, here is... Uh, the deed is presumed to be delivered when it's been um, given to the grantee, recorded, placed in escrow, okay? Kind of a trick question, so just, you know, really shows you have to read these questions carefully. Jim and Kim want to purchase a home and avoid paying private mortgage insurance. What is Jim and Kim's best option? Hmm. They want to purchase a home and avoid paying private mortgage insurance. Well, private mortgage insurance is insurance that insures the lender that if they make you a loan and you default, they won't be out any money. It's just kind of insurance. It's a it's a, an insurance company that's saying to the lender, "Look, we're going to provide insurance because if Jim and Kim ever default and you have to resell it or whatever, we'll, we'll, pick, up, we'll pick up the loss. So the, in, the lender, you know, keep in mind if I'm a lender and I'm giving you $100,000 and you're only putting down 5%, that would be $5,000. Well, private mortgage insurance is saying to me that don't worry Mr. Linder, we'll pick up that $95,000. You're insured, so I don't have to worry about any kind of loss for my uh, depositors at my bank, right? I'm a bank, and so I don't want to be, if I'm loaning lots of money out and nobody's paying me back and I can't sell these properties for what they're worth, then all of a sudden, you and others who have deposits at my bank or at the bank could lose money, right? And we don't want that to happen. So, if you do not put 20% or more down as a down payment, the lender will require you as the borrower to pay what is called private mortgage insurance. So, in my example, I'm loaning you $100,000. You only give me $5,000 down. The private mortgage insurance will say, well, based on a $95,000 loan or only putting 5% down, here's what the premium will cost. 
And so me as a lender will pass that cost on to you as the borrower. And normally they will allow you to pay that in monthly payments. And so that's going to be tacked on to your loan. So it's going to make your loan payment a little higher. However, you didn't have to come up with $20,000. That would be 20% on a $100,000 loan. You only have to come up with $5,000. But you will have to pay that private mortgage insurance. So now, knowing all of that, Jim and Kim want to purchase a home and avoid paying private. They don't want to pay private mortgage insurance. What's their best option? Take out a larger loan. Make sure they get an FHA loan. Make a smaller down payment. Or I think it's D, don't you? Now, you always want to read the questions how many times? Three times. For the sake of our show, we're not going to do that today, but you want to make a larger down payment. Remember, anything less than 20% down, you have to take out private mortgage insurance. So make a larger down payment. That would take care of it. Roger and Kathy enter into a sales contract with buyer will. The purchase contract specifies that both Tim Doyle, the listing broker, and Roger and Kathy may keep the earnest money if will defaults. This stipulation is known as, well, that's interesting, and I don't cover that a lot, but we're covering it today, right? <laughs> well, if Roger and Kathy enter into a sales contract with buyer Will, so Roger and Kathy are the sellers, Will's the buyer, and this purchase contract specifies that both Tim Doyle, the listing broker, and Roger and Kathy may keep the earnest money if will defaults. This stipulation is known as, well, that's known as liquidated damages. Liquidated damages, and I do cover this in the course, cover losses regardless of the actual amount of losses agreed in advance that will compensate the injured party. I just don't cover it in the form of, of earnest money, I cover it in other parts of, of the, the course. But an interesting take to, to remind yourself of a definition that liquidated damages covers losses regardless of the actual amount of losses. So if you gave $500 earnest money, that's what's going that's the liquidated damages you get to keep is the $500 even if you lost $100 or you lost $5000 okay and so just understand what liquidated damages are quick plug for our digital flashcards that you can pick up at globalrealestateschool.com they're not that much and they work on your mobile phone and if you buy the ultimate real estate exam prep which you can also check out at globalrealestateschool.com those flashcards are included and you have videos short coaching videos content all accessible from your mobile phone i'm telling you what you'll pass the exam and that works in all 50 states. So if you're watching us in Alaska where I'm not approved yet, you can still get the ultimate real estate exam coach because it works there as well. Okay. So check those out. Globalrealestateschool.com. Well, Tim signs a mortgage with his bank. Tim asks his loan closer about the clause in the mortgage, the contractor deed of trust, that would allow his lender, First National Bank, to demand the entire unpaid balance due if he were to default on the loan. Which clause should the loan closer point to, and what is the clause called? <laughs> Tim, is it the, he's closing a loan, and, he, and he's like, okay, I'm signing this mortgage with the bank, uh, Mr. or Mrs. Closer, what is the clause in here or where is it at? What is, what's it called that says that First National could demand the entire unpaid balance due if, if I were to default on the loan? Well, the loan closer may freak out a little bit, but they would then say, oh, that's called an acceleration clause, okay? 
defeasance clause is when the note is defeated, when you pay it off, okay? That says the mortgage the more the mortgage is defeated and so the the lender needs to issue you what is called a satisfaction piece. That's what the defeasance clause, the, the loans defeated. The subrogation clause is where the lender can substitute themselves into your shoes to go after a claim. If they if you get paid damages due to an insurance item then the lender could substitute themselves and go after you. Kind of like your auto insurance. If you're in a car wreck and you have full coverage, the, the insurance company is going to go ahead and pay you what you're out. But then there, that subrogation clause says the insurance company can now go and try to get their money back from the person who hit you or the person whose fault it was and collect money from them and that subrogation says you allow them to be substituted on your behalf if they pay you off any damages. But the acceleration clause, that's the clause that says the lender can demand the entire balance due and payable. Now, at what level are property taxes normally established? Well, just remember, if you see this, normally... Property taxes, and that's the key, property taxes are on a local or county level, okay? Property county taxes are local or county levels. Paul is a property manager of a large complex in Dallas, Texas. As a representative of the landlord, what must Paul do? Hmm... Paul is a property manager of a large complex in Dallas, Texas. As a representative of a landlord, what must Paul do? Well, should Paul find five or more suitable tenants, help the tenants submit offers, meet monthly with the landlord, or avoid giving false or misleading information to a tenant, even if the tenant is represented by a real estate agent? Well, I think that's kind of a A no-brainer there, a quick one, you got that one right. But let me give you a couple of questions that I was recently uh, out in the yard and a bird just flew by and dropped these out of the air. Could, uh, Could a landlord go in and just inspect the property without your permission what would that violate the constructive your constructive right um you know your your ability to rent that property well um you know you can't do that as a property manager so if you see a question about can the property manager just go in and uh, just verify there's no pets or check without you being there no that you're you have a right of quiet enjoyment and that's kind of violating that okay now read these questions carefully because they can always flip these a little bit if there was a a water burst or some emergency yeah the property manager could enter your apartment if water was falling through down below but just to go check to see if you have a pet or something like that, I wouldn't think that you could do that. Now, um, what if there was a fire and three people died? Would the property manager be responsible for that situation well and i don't know a lot about this question (laughs) you know who's responsible uh is the property manager negligent uh failure to repair first of all i don't know why they would even ask a question like that because to me that's a legal question but i would read the question very carefully one of the choices is who's responsible and 
heirs and omissions might be on there, uh, that would they be responsible? You need to really read and find out what what's inside that question. If the property manager knew about a problem and neglected to have it fixed, could they share in the responsibility of that situation? I would think they probably could, wouldn't you? Um, just because you have heirs and omissions insurance, that does, and I probably need to look that up, heirs and omissions does cover instances where you, you know, where you maybe have made a mistake. However, if there was, you know, outright negligence, I don't know. That's just a real tough question. I don't know why they would ask that question, but just kind of be, you know, on a heads up on that. And I'll try to do some more research before we meet again. But I, I, my, my gut feeling and based on kind of the information I had is the errors and emissions insurance is probably the correct answer on that. Um, you might see a question on antitrust. We cover a lot of antitrust in the course. Remember, antitrust covers things about price fixing, which we talked about earlier on the class. Uh, allocating markets, keeping someone from joining a multiple listing service boycotting another agency because they don't pay, uh, you know, commissions to what you, to what you would hope they would pay. In other words, um, I started to mention this earlier. If, if the, if a broker says, I'm only paying you a dollar to sell my house. Well, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, a dollar's our co-op fee. Uh, commissions are negotiable. Well, if you said and got together with other people and say, we're going to boycott John because he's only paying a dollar as a commission split, that's a violation of antitrust. I was in a meeting in Washington, D.C. at the National Association of Realtors, and it was professional standards, which is, or not, pardon me, professional development, which is for instructors. It was very interesting because there was a gentleman who stood up and said, uh, in our market, and I won't mention the name of the area, but it was a very hot market. He said, uh, they're only paying a dollar as co-op uh, compensation. And that's not right. You can't do that. And people in the room, some of the people in the room were saying, well, that's not right. You can't do that. And those of us who, you know, remind ourselves commissions are negotiable were like, number one, you shouldn't be having a conversation about commissions in a public setting in a room like that. In fact, you should get up and excuse yourself and say, I'm not taking part of any kind of conversations with commissions. That's just it, period. But secondly, those of us who were in the room, we immediately said, hey, commissions are negotiable. If they only want to charge a dollar, that's their right to do that. There's nothing wrong with that. Commissions are always negotiable. That's why you, as an agent, need to have a conversation with the consumer that you want to become a client. Remember, uh, they're just a customer until they sign an agency agreement with you. And at that point, they become a client. You need to have that conversation and say, look, this is what I charge for my services. The, you know, these are my, this is what you're going to get from my company. And this is what we provide all of our folks. And because of this, we charge this. Now, I'll try to collect that from the other agency through the seller if they're willing to pay that in a cooperative agreement. But I don't know. They may just say, we're only going to pay a dollar to a buyer's agent. And if that's the case, and if that's what's posted in the multiple listing service, then I'm going to have to try to collect the difference that we charge and what I'm going to get if I sell you that property. So commissions are always negotiable. So antitrust, just remember that. Um, let's see. Oh, a couple of things here. And I want to go to this very quickly. There, you definitely could see some questions right here with this TIL, you know, truth and lending and RESPA, uh, the Truth in Lending Act and, 
and Respa. Now, first of all, right down here, the closing disclosures, okay? And there's this three-day business days waiting period before consummation. So let's just look at a couple of these questions. If there is a change to the disclosed terms after the creditor provides the initial closing disclosure, is the creditor required to ensure the consumer receives a corrected closing disclosure at least three business days before consummation? In other words, you go to the lender and they, they're required within three days of meeting with them when they give you this closing disclosure, if there's a change, do they have to re-give you that information? And the answer we'll see here is it depends on the type of change. As discussed below, there are three types of changes that require the creditor to ensure that the consumer receives a corrected closing disclosure at least three business days before consummation. I'm telling you, this was, according to a bird, this was recently something they, this bird saw. Am I, is that wrong or does that sound goofy? But <laughs> just write this, take good notes here, okay? For other types of changes, a creditor is not required to ensure the consumer receives a closing disclosure, okay? So let's go through these. A creditor must ensure that a consumer receives an initial closing disclosure no later than three days before closing. If the disclosed term change after the creditor has provided this, the creditor must provide a corrected closing disclosure unless the change is one of three types of changes covered below. Now, here we go. Number one, the change results in the APR becoming inaccurate. Okay? If that happens, then the creditor must ensure you as a buyer or the consumer receives a closing disclosure three days before consummation of the transaction. So that's the annual percentage rate becomes inaccurate. Keep that in mind when you're reading the question. Write that down. Number two, if the loan product information required to be disclosed under the truth and lending disclosure rule has become inaccurate the loan product information. In other words, were you getting a three-year arm and they've discovered all the information they provided about how the adjustable rate is incorrect? I think either one of those would be pretty easy to answer. The, the rate changes or is it inaccurate or the information about the loan they gave you is inaccurate or if the prepayment penalty to the loan, if a prepayment penalty to the loan. Okay, so everybody with me here? Any of these three types of changes would trigger a new three business day waiting period. Whew. That's going to be on the test. Very well could be on the test, okay? So let's go over them again so you understand that. This has to do with the clo loan closing, to the closing disclosure. If the APR is inaccurate, you came in, wanted to get a loan, I gave you a closing disclosure, and I have to give that to you within three business days. If before we close the loan, I have discovered that the APR I quoted you is inaccurate, then I have to give you a new closing disclosure form, and we can't close for three days after you receive that. Got it? APR, annual percentage rate, is inaccurate. Number two, the loan product that I quoted you, we discovered is inaccurate. People make mistakes. It's, you know, it's inaccurate. 
It's interesting. I won't do that. I, we're, we're, you know, I was going to show you something that I watched that was like a big time, a big time production. And they had a blatant mistake right on their handout. And I thought, okay, I have mistakes occasionally in my course, but uh, so it's okay, right? We all make mistakes, but they could make a mistake in the loan product they quoted you. And if they do, if they figure out, oh my gosh, we gave Mayfield and his wife a closing disclosure and the product we're quoting them, somebody went back and did the math and we're wrong. So we've got to fix our our product information, you're going to have to give me a new form three days before we can close. And the third is now I'm charging you a prepayment penalty. And I didn't charge that before. We just initiated a new prepayment penalty. Have to wait three days. There's a question that was seen about waiting three days or the time period. So it's the closing disclosure form. Now I want to go back over here again. Let's take a look at number two. Is a creditor required to ensure that a consumer receives a corrected closing disclosure form three business days? We just talked about that, but I'm just going to open this up. And the answer depends on whether the overstated APR that was previously disclosed on the closing disclosure is accurate or inaccurate. We talked about that, didn't we? Um, so look at that. And then the third one talks about um, some other stuff, but we won't go into that. I did want to remind you the, we talked about the closing. There's some good information here. And by the way, you can go to consumerfinance.gov and just search for or look at T-I-L-A RESPA. You're going to see some questions on that. In fact, I'm going to do, a, I'll do a whole section on that for you. So uh, don't panic about that. We'll, we'll definitely make sure that we get something here for you in the near future. Okay. Well, let's go back to our questions. And uh, we want to jump back over here at a recent sales meeting and wants to know which type of listing the broker requires of the agents. The broker, whose name is Kim, tells Anne that she wants everyone to concentrate on getting listings for the office that provides the most protection to the company. Which type of listing agreement is Kim referring to? Well, the most type of protection is what? It's an exclusive right to sell listing. Again, I've seen and heard about this question over and over and over. Remember, the most protective type of listing agreement is it is the exclusive right to sell. The least protective is an open listing. And the one that gives you a little bit more protection but still allows the seller to sell it is an exclusive listing. Net listings, they love that question too. A net listing is when I say to you, look, all I want is $100,000. Anything over $100,000 you can keep, John. And you go out and you list it for $150,000 and sell it. And so you keep 50,000 and give me 100. That's called a net listing. Those are illegal in some states. There are some states that allow that, but many states do not allow that. But just remember what a net listing is. And also remember the most protective type of listing, exclusive right to sell listing. Now, according to the class and the section covering deeds, when would you say the legal title to real property passes from the seller to the buyer? Is that when the deed is delivered? When the deed is recorded? When the deed is placed in escrow? Or when the closing is completed at the escrow office? Hmm... According to the class in the section covering deeds, we do cover this. When would you say the legal title to real property passes from the seller to the buyer? Well, is it when the deed is delivered, when it's recorded, placed in escrow, or completed at the office? 
do deeds always have to be recorded? No, they do not. So the best answer is the actual delivery. And that's, you know, while a deed placed in escrow is a form of delivery and recording is a form of delivery, whenever I deliver the deed to you and you accept it, then that would, that's when we basically say title has passed. They kind of had a weird question before where if I sign the deed and I deliver it to you, give it to you, and you put it in your desk drawer and then you're killed in a car wreck, is that property in your name? And the answer is sure, because I delivered it to you, right? When the deed was delivered and you accepted it and you put it in your desk drawer and then you're killed in a car wreck, well, that legal delivery had already taken place. And so that deed title to the real property has passed to the buyer, even though they never took it and recorded it at the courthouse. It was signed by me. It was delivered from me to you. You accepted it, put it in your desk drawer, and unfortunately were killed in a car wreck, but your heirs would have that property would be theirs and they could go on. You might see a question like that. Which statement best describes them all? Oh, that's where we're at. Hey, we've come to the conclusion of our time together. But let me see here. Uh, I had one other thing here I wanted to tell you. Well, I think that's it. But they have been asking a question about amortization tables. And I have this in my course, and I'm still having students that are writing me saying, hey, John, there was a question about an amortization table, and I didn't know how to do it. And I'm thinking, it's at the school. <laughs> so... You're going to be able to watch that video next because I'm going to add the card that's going to pop up anytime that says watch the amortization video. So be sure and watch that. Okay. It's an important video to watch. You will see it on the test. Hey, thanks for watching today's live stream. We'll be back next Thursday. I'll talk to you then. Have a great day, everyone.